Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for the Dolly Poetry Series. It's really great to have you guys back. I appreciate it. We've got a, a wonderful program tonight, three incredible poets. It's going to be so much fun. Um, uh, we've had a couple of them here before, uh, both Gloria and Curtis, and we're delighted to have Tyler this time. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I wanted to first do a shout out. Really, I need to start with the museum because this museum has been so terrific and so um, supportive of this poetry series. Um, we're going on, what is it, eight something years now. Um, and I've been lucky to be the curator for it. Um, but part of the reason I enjoy it is because it's always a great audience. I mean, you guys bring so much to it, especially with your questions. I hope some of you will do that again tonight. Um, but uh, I know that many of you who come to the series when you're able to, uh, are writers yourselves. And um, we really appreciate it because there's so much going on in St. Pete. There's a ton of stuff even tonight. So I'm thrilled to see all of you here. Uh, I want to do a shout out too for the city of St. Petersburg for supporting our program. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, I will do as Hank requests. He, as you know, is our wonderful executive director of the museum. He is so sorry he could not be here tonight. Um, but he, he sends his regrets, regrets and his hellos, and, um, and he asks me to start with one poem of my own, um, which I typically do. Sometimes I skirt it, but um, I will do it tonight. And in part because um, this is a poem that I wrote um, for a really cool thing happening in our city. Um, it's called the, the Murals in Mind Project. And uh, Terry Marks from the, the St. Petersburg Arts Alliance and also the Love Lawrence Organization, um, the Community Foundation, many others have been supporting this really cool thing. Um, and it is to bring together artists of all different kinds, um, creatives of all different kinds within St. Pete and aimed at the intersection of art and wellness. Um, it involves murals that are in the city and pairing it with different kinds of artists. And this is a poem that I was asked to write um, a, in dialogue with artist Yala Ford's mural, um, which is the big heart that's off of Beach Drive that you might have seen before. The original title was called um, The Heart's a Maze. But uh, just so you know, the, the online gallery for this event is going to be opening on the 14th because they see it as a Valentine they're giving the city of St. Pete, which is really cool. Um, and if you want to go to the online gallery, it's stpeteartsalliance.org slash murals in mind. And you can see all the various murals and the, and the different performances um, that are uh, collaborating. This poem is called, well, now called, Road Trip to Everywhere. And it has an epigraph by Jack Kerouac, nowhere to go but everywhere. Freeways and exits, gas gauge tipping into red. You drive to bury your dead or invite them to join you. That Wawa on the corner lit up with bags of chips and chocolate bars, peeled and pickled eggs and stacks of beer. These phosphorescent years have slayed you. Your, life li your lifeline veering toward potholes, detours, dead ends but for the kindness of friends and blasting Bonnie Raitt as you leave behind that ticker tape of weeks. You, with your caravan of needs, craving every sideshow, it's easy to lose yourself in love. Littered, littered alleys intersect with unexpected beauty, a slick glaze of avenues stitched with neon light, a sultry saxophone, and there they are, loved ones you've lost, dancing on the down low and toasting life's inconspicuous gifts. 
a stranger's shared umbrella in the rain, the student who helped change your flat, the stray cat that somehow chose you, refusing to untangle from your calves, all forgotten keys that opened whatever had been locked up too long. You drive till the drive takes you home and fishtail to the park that welcomes the heart's erratic turns. Cut the ignition, wait, taste the salt air on your lips as the sun dips red toward the bay like the nub of your last cigarette, or at least what you hope is your last. The heart's a maze, it's easy to get lost, but you're here, you've always been here. So we are lucky to start off, thank you, lucky to start off tonight with Tyler um, Gillespie. Um, Tyler is a fifth generation Floridian who wrote The Thing About Florida, Exploring a Misunderstood State, that was published in 2021, and the poetry collections Florida Man Poems, published by Red Flag Poetry in 2018, and The Nature Machine, that will be published Fantastic, congratulations, by Autofocus in 2023. His multi-genre writing often focuses on the state's environment, its history and culture, and LGBTQ um, communities. And he's reported on these topics from Rolling Stone, The Washington Post, GQ, The Guardian, The Daily Beast, Vice, and Playboy. He's co-founder of the local artist, the Florida Local Artist and Writer Network, and teaches writing at Ringling College of Art and Design. Welcome, Tyler. Hi there. <laughs> I want to start off by saying thank you so much for having me. As a fifth generation Floridian, I grew up in Pinellas County, I grew up in Largo, so the Dali as an artist and a museum has been really important to me and my imagination and what I could do as a creative in this state. So I'm really honored to be here. So I have a few things that I wanna say before I get into these readings. So the first thing is, so we are a little self-promotion, What you know, why not? Um, I will be selling prints that are based off some of these poems, and they're in collaboration with Print St. Pete, um, which is a local printmaker who unfortunately had a severe accident and broke her ankle, so she cannot use the printing presses. So any um, sales from those prints will be going to her. She's a dear friend of mine. Okay. So I'm going to be reading kind of a smattering of stuff from Florida Man to a poem that I wrote this week, um, specifically for tonight. So this first poem that I'm going to read is actually a poem in the newsletter that Gloria, Gloria and I and other folks have started um, that Helen talked about. And if you'd like to sign up for that, there's a sheet outside as well. I think that's all the promotion I'll be doing. Now <laughs> to the poetry. This poem is called Alligator Heart. Bag of sugar-sized muscle pumps blood. Most reptiles, three-chambered heart, but gator, four chambers like mammals and birds, which gators used to be millions of years ago when they were dinosaurs. Over time, wings went missing, can't fly no more. Alligator males grow over 12 feet. Florida record, 14 foot, three and a half inches, found in Brevard County. His heart must keep strong. Animals depend on gator to stay alive. In dry season, he uses mouth and claws to clear out roots and marsh beats tail and creates mud burrow, a gator hole. Cold-blooded depression helps him stay warm. Hole fills with rain and fresh water drunk by snakes, insects, turtles, and birds, long lost gator cousins. Heart makes him dangerous, of course, but maybe under scales, thick set of armor, he still feels wings, remembers a time he flew so free next to clouds. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read the last 
poem in this book. So this book looks at, you know, Florida through the prism of Florida man and it as a trope and also just kind of the humanity of the state and the environment. So this last, po it's the last poem of the book and it's called Florida Man, A Self-Portrait. I'd usually make a joke. Crazy stuff happens everywhere. You just hear about it more in Florida because we have sun, salt water, and drugs. <laughs> lots and lots of drugs. But now I have something different to tell. In Gulf of Mexico, ancient mangroves, walking trees are survivors. Deep root systems filter and shelter bright fish and corals. And as a child, I played in their legs and stepped on sea urchins. My blood mixed with salt water and sand. I swam with wild dolphins. Manatees and nurse sharks give birth to live young, about 20 to 50 pups collected these sand dollars, got bleached white by the sun, could identify shells, turkey wings, coquina, keyhole limpet, we called pyramid. Felt push of undertow, current moves offshore as waves approach, can drag people out to sea like messages placed in a bottle. Don't fight this current. Try to swim in direction of shoreline, Handy wisdom decades later, when friend from Maine and I were stuck in water, far from beach towels and cooler snacks, she started to panic, helped guide her. Juan Ponce de Leon first documented the Florida Peninsula in the early 1500s, but people lived here long before that. He wanted to find the fountain of youth, become forever young, visit plastic surgeons in Miami. Look south to Cuba, to those who fled Castro's regime. Refugees helped make this city magic. Dredged beaches once submerged. Scientists say it will happen again if we don't stop what we're doing soon. And of course, we won't stop what we're doing soon. Years ago, a boy drove me through oranges, state symbol on license plates, groves stretched to late night horizon between Tampa and Orlando. He stopped the car, and I looked up at thousands of stars and a dreamlike reality. Orange groves homesteaded in the early 1900s as neat rows. Anchors have shrunk as men do in old age, thinned by Asian citrus fissilid, which carries bacteria, attacks vascular system and kills trees, plus hurricanes and freezes devastated crops. Production was down over 60% since the year I tried to leave these Florida stories behind me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to read a lot of a different Dolly, Dolly Parton poem. <laughs> so this uh, is a new anthology that actually came out last month. It's called Let Me Say This, a Dolly Parton poetry anthology. It's really good, not just because I'm in it, but <laughs> I mean, I won't get sidetracked about my love for Dolly Parton right now. It's called Dolly Parton Argues a Theory of Linguistics, Posits. Dolly Parton Argues a Theory of Linguistics, Posits. We construct identities through words, and just because I'm blonde, don't think I'm dumb. Saucer, however, might disagree. Claims language is arbitrary. The relationship between signifiers and signified is socially encoded, relies on difference. We define words, concepts, by what they are not. This rationale of dis difference then extends to people as we construct identities through words. Parton, of course, is one of our greatest philosophers, often cited for her nine to five treatise on capitalism. I admire her dedication to working class struggles, but it's her embrace of difference I find most radical, the way we see both ourselves and each other in her words. Okay, so this is from my new collection coming out in May. And it's also a, a poem that I was commissioned by um, the You Good series, which is about mental health and art. And it's also a poem that I wrote for my grandmother before she passed away. <clears throat> New nature, 
And this poem has an exclamation mark in the title, which is important. You'll, you'll find out later. <laughs> New nature. I dressed myself in coral and kelp, then drove headfirst to drink the tides. I say to my grandma over the phone. She hates when I talk in metaphors. But darling, I'm a poet born of deep waters. She tells me, I'm going to let you go now. <laughs> I walk to the corner store and buy cigarettes. I quit smoking when I gave up drinking ocean water. But I still finger packs and fight my nature. Marble reds, a loaf of bread. I feed the goose. He's my least favorite bird. He isn't beautiful as a cardinal or regal like the eagle. I bring him dinner to make amends for the ugly parts of me I only talk about in metaphors. I should forgive myself, I know, but buying bread is so much easier. In the park's lake, the lonely alligator sings. I've always loved these reptiles. They don't hide their teeth. I eat the goose's bread in solidarity with the gator and head back home. There's a voicemail from my grandma, but I wait a week to hear her say, next time remember, there are some bugs who burrow without ever once looking at the sky. Yeah, come on in, it's all good, we're here. Okay, I have a few more poems. And so remember how I said the last poem had an exclamation mark in it? This poem is called, I'm tired of people using exclamation marks. <laughs> I'm tired of people using exclamation marks, sparingly. And I reject books with strict rules on grammar, ideas about professional punctuation, and advice from writers like Mark Twain, who apparently believed we should only use three exclamation marks our whole entire lives, which sounds so strict like a corset, when all I want to do is strut. Darling, I just couldn't live that way. I use my whole grammatical life in just one email, if I like a person, or in a single poem, if I'm feeling saucy, like today. <laughs> Even though some people say this piece of punctuation makes writers look immature, I think they are fun, friendly, and sometimes even flirty and the right fingers. And I believe anyone reading this poem could use more of that on their pages before this sentence called life abruptly flourishes its final and full stop. Okay, so I have two more poems. And usually at readings, I like to read more fun poems like this exclamation mark. But I've substituted one of my fun poems for a poem that I, I wrote this week that I felt this situation called for. Not this situation, but what's going on in Florida, our situation. It's called, I didn't want to write another political poem. But then Florida banned bodies, banned books politicians hadn't read, banned things we can think and say, a gay man who's taught in the same Florida school for almost 50 years told me, it's just too much. I didn't want to write another political poem about power and men who have it. Instead, I wanted to write a poem about the moon as a metaphor for queer love. I wanted to write about how sexy I find punctuation. <laughs> my desire to cuddle with ethically non-monogamous question marks. <laughs> Allen Ginsberg howled, it's the job of the poet to keep people up at night thinking. Florida, of course, banned him too, and the beats in the 50s, called them the downfall of American literature. Sound familiar? Poems they haven't read help us understand ourselves, each other, and power doesn't want that. Some theorists argue all poems are political on the aesthetic level. Poetry plays with line, breaks ideas of grammar and logic 
and forms its own conclusions. I don't know if I agree with those theorists, but I do know Florida is my home, and this poem cannot sit in silence. So I stand with band, books, and bodies, and teachers, and anyone who thinks it's just too much. I mean, we may not all agree on poetry's function, but I think most of us are tired of powers who say they don't get our lines when they haven't even tried to read them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now back to fun. <laughs> so I wrote this poem before I knew that I was going to be reading at the Dali, and it has a reference to Dali in it. And it's also a love poem, and since Valentine's Day is coming up, I thought I'd end on this poem. It's called Pickup Line. You're so handsome, I want us to leave this bar and hold hands in my car. We'll skip all the steps to my apartment. You'll look at the Dali print in my living room and hesitate before you tell me a secret. You love the Surrealists. They're your favorite painters. I'll laugh seagulls as I cut limes for a nightcap, listen to the knife, make love to the rind. I'll tell you about the time Hugh Jackman asked me for directions. You'll tell me about the time you caught your father cheating. I'm sorry I'm a liar, I'll say. Is it hot in here, you'll say, or is it just you? I'll put on a sweater, then a coat. You'll tell me I'm funny without even trying. When the Joni record stops, we'll make our way to my bedroom. I'll ask you to read the poems you write during breaks at the factory or wherever it is that you work. You'll tell me you usually don't do this kind of thing. Nervously, you'll unzip your bag, pull out a notebook, show me your pages. They're so wonderful, I'll say, and mean it. I'll ask you to read them again, again, and again, thank you. What a great reading. Thank you, Tyler. Um, and excited about your next book. Cool. So May? May 2023. OK, good. Good to know. Um, I want to do a shout out to many of you writers out there. I can't see all of you, but um, I, I did see some ahead of time um, when we were out front. I see Bob Devin Jones. Welcome, Bob. Thank you for being here. And Roy Peter Clark is here somewhere. There he is. Um, I saw Anne Nay, who is a terrific writer and happens to be a former student of mine. Hello, Anne, where are you? <laughs> I know Keith is here. Keith, there you are in the second row. And Hervey, where are you, Hervey? Evans, there you are. Welcome, Hervey. Um, and um, I know that there are others that I've, I've met. Oh, Zen, of course. We've had Zen here in the Dolly also before. So wonderful. Glad to have you back. Um, and a special hello to our state poet laureate um, and my favorite poet in the universe um, and such a generous, kind soul, Peter Meinke, right here. <laughs> and the rest of you who are writers, please raise your hand so we can see you here and, and hello and thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. So. Um, So before I go on to introducing Curtis, I want to mention, and you guys probably saw this, that Tumblr Books is selling books um, and broadsides, Tyler's broadsides, um, out front. So hope you'll be able to um, check those out uh, before you leave today. Um, we are delighted to have Curtis back. And I've had the pleasure of seeing Curtis read and perform um, in the interim from when we last had you here, which Zen thinks was maybe 2019. Yeah, so um, yeah. Curtis Davis has been writing and performing poetry since a youth in high school and has since traveled all over the states competing at international, national, and regional poetry slam competitions. Born and raised in Tampa, 
Um, in 2018, he was ranked the eighth poet in the world after becoming a finalist in the individual World Poetry Slam in San Diego, California. That is huge. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, he is the creative director of a 501c3 nonprofit called Heard Em Say. Um, you guys probably know of that. We've had Wally B. Jennings here before also. Um, uh, the, it's an arts collective, and he's also the co-founder of Grow House, an artist collective dedicated to growing community, growing culture, and growing creatives through poetry and hip hop. Um, Grow House hosts a monthly poetry slam and weekly poetry workshops inside the historical Crest building in Ybor City. Cool. So welcome, Curtis. So great to have you back. Hello. Yeah, I guess I did my plugs already in my bio, so I don't need to say all that anymore. <laughs> um, my name is Curtis Davis. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Happy to be back. Thank you so much for having me. Um, great job, Tyler. Enjoy your work. Um, I'm just going to start off like this. Uh, Tired of dragging yourself like a living corpse to your dead-end job that you literally have no passion for? Can't seem to make it through the workday without doubting the ability to reach your personal goals? Try our premium, premium, premium espresso. <laughs> With Cafe Bustello, you'll be able to suppress those nasty negative thoughts to the back of your head and just go, allowing you to die slowly, pain-free. It's no wonder coffee. Sounds so close to coffin. Just listen to what one of our customers had to say. Hey, I'm Curtis Davis, 29 years old. Always wanted to be a famous poet and one day travel the world performing my poetry, but then I found Bustello and realized my daily nine to five desk job isn't all that bad. See, Cafe Bustello, the closest thing to Coke to get you through your work day. Stay woke. Thank you. Uh, that poem is titled uh, Cafe Bustello, <laughs> simply enough. Um, a lot of my work is kind of like that. It reflects like things that I experience in my real life. Like I literally work a daily nine to five desk job and uh, um, it comes from a real place. And a lot, that's what, how a lot of my work uh, is. It's a lot of uh, personal experiences and things like that. Um, but yeah, let's just go ahead and keep it moving. Uh, this next poem is uh, my, my actually my newest piece. I just finished it like last weekend. Um, I performed it for the first time at Grow House's first Monday's open mic this past uh, Monday. Um, and yeah, it's a very emotional piece for me. It's still kind of raw. Um, I don't think I've titled it yet, actually. I just realized that I have not titled it. Um, I'll title it right now. It's called German Castle. In the summer of third grade, rewind. <laughs> Living room, chapter one. In the summer of third grade, I presented the corpse of my gerbil named Max to my parents in the living room. His dead little body stiff in my palms, the bedding he suffocated on still sticking from his mouth. My gerbil Max, buried himself alive. And I wonder if that is why this is one of my greatest fears, to be put in the ground, trapped inside of a box I can't claw my way out of, even though I've dug my own grave once or a few times before. See, I've seen the face of death when I carried my grandfather's casket, and more times than I can count, through the screen of my iPhone, I've seen it. In the video games I play, in the movies I watch, thought I saw death in the mirror once when I was a little boy, blood spouting from skull onto white tea. Nowadays, I see death every time I look in the mirror and don't recognize myself anymore. But 
no matter how much I've seen it, I can't seem to get over this fear of not being alive. Got the words, every day above ground is a good day tattooed on my forearm, but still have the nerve to forget. It's funny how forgiveness can feel like forgetfulness. Chapter two. December 1st, 2022, baby nephew Kai is born with holes in his heart, but more love than his little body can hold and stitched my sister's heart whole. January 2023, great grandma Hilda is put on hospice. She is a German castle with more love than her little body can hold, who does not know the meaning of fear, but is all too familiar with what it means to die. My mother holds her hand in the living room as the whole family holds our breath. I think they call this duality. I think I'll call it a long life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, real quick, I want to give a quick shout out to Bob again. I know we just did that, but um, uh, this is also a plug, I guess, as well, another plug. But uh, Crow House is doing a collaboration with uh, an organization called The Blunt Space. We have a poetry slam happening on March 5th. It's actually going to be going down at Studio 620. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Bob, for, for everything you've done. That place has so much historical um, significance, and uh, I just appreciate you, man. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to read some of my uh, written work. Um, I don't get very many opportunities to to do this because I'm always doing the you know the spoken word stuff. Um, so I'm going to read some poems here. Uh, this poem is titled Otis. And I'm sorry, this these next few this like next leg of poems is kind of on the downside downer side of things. So, <laughs> well, I'm gonna end off a little on a on a bit a bit of a higher note, just so you know. <laughs> A Change Is Gonna Come is one of my favorite covers by Otis because you can hear the honesty in his voice when he says it's been too hard living and that he's afraid to die because he doesn't know what's up there beyond the clouds. I too have found myself digging in the pockets of others. Sorry, I too have found myself digging in the pockets of other people trying to find change or pieces of myself I thought were stolen away. I too was born by a river with dirty water that splits my hometown in two, almost died on the day of my birth, so call me Hillsborough County Miracle. And I too have found myself staring into the sky, trying to see what sits behind the clouds, terrified of dying, but tired of living. Uh, this poem is titled Blue Hand. If I were a ghost, I'd spend, my I'd spend my afterlife making art on the walls of abandoned homes, turning broken, forgotten things into something beautiful. I would paint murals over LED billboards, let their light shine through, make my art pour out onto the pavement and people underneath. I'd create self-portraits that no one could see, using only my hand in hopes the paint would stain my ghost body and someone would notice me. And if they do, honestly, they would probably just freak out at the sight of a blue floating hand holding a brush. Wine break. <laughs> All right. Um, this poem is titled Protein. Yesterday, I saw a video of a boy eating a zebra butterfly. 
Its wings were still sticking out of his mouth until he pulled them in, in with his tongue and mashed its body with his teeth. Today, I am the zebra butterfly, and life is the boy, clenching my body between its teeth and spitting bones out like the hot wings I had last night for dinner. Tomorrow, I will be the zebra boy, snatching life out of the air, clenching it between my jaws until its wings flutter against my lips and make my words take flight. How much time do I have? I meant to time myself. How much more time do I have? Uh, I'm guessing maybe another five minutes. Okay, cool. All right. I'll do uh, two more pieces for y'all. Um, this next poem is titled, yeah, I'm going to do this one, Dog Eyes. How many people in here can remember their first kiss? Show of hands. <laughs> My first kiss was in the second grade with a girl named Samantha. Samantha was, Samantha was one of my best friends. She whispered in my ear one day on the playground that she loved me. I whispered back that I loved her too. I dated a girl in high school for two months named Holly. I dated a girl in high school for one year and two months named Ashley. My last ex's name that I spent almost three years with is Kelly. My mother's name is Kimberly. My Aunt Rhonda calls her Bim Bomb. My grandmother's name is Rebecca. All my life, I've called her Grandma Becky. I love my Grandma Becky. I have loved white women since before I knew how to love my blackness, since before I knew what it felt like to love and be loved by a black woman, back before, when I couldn't breathe anything but, anything but contradiction. Black boy with white mouth, all bite and no bark, dog eyes, can't see himself as being any color. And his daddy, his daddy tells him he's black, but the other black boys tell him he's white. Back when a token was something you spent at an arcade, not something you were. Funny joke I heard in the fifth grade from one of my friends, how do you get black kids to stop jumping on the bed? Easy, just put Velcro on the ceiling. I never understood why I couldn't find any laughter hidden in the corners of this white mouth. Maybe it was because my hair didn't grow like the other black boys. Maybe it was because everything about me wasn't like the other black boys. Seventh grade, I moved from my predominantly white school to a school in a sea of black faces, most darker than mine. And I cried every day after school for the first week because I felt like I just couldn't fit in. And everybody just wants to be able to fit inside their own body. Fast forward to my first and only year of college, spent on FAMU's campus in Tallahassee, Florida, a school historically known for being a sea of black faces, most darker than mine. And I fell in love for the first time with myself. Now today, and my pops was right, I am a black man falling in love for the first time with a black woman, back be with a black woman birthed from a hurricane off the coast of Barbados, she's taught me the darkest star can shine the brightest. We call each other lover without moving our lips. We sing and it sounds like church organs being played underwater. We exchange organs, our hearts, our hearts too big for our bodies. These veins pump nothing but blood on the good days and on the bad ones too. The love of my life, my wife, is a beautiful black woman named Zen Christian. Our first kiss was on our second date, and I whispered in her ear one night in bed that I loved her, and she whispered back 
that she loves me too. Thank you, thank you. I wasn't planning on doing that piece, I just kind of threw it in there, but I'm happy I did it. <laughs> also, my wife is here, so uh, scores me brownie points, you know. <laughs> All right, my last poem uh, that I'll uh, close off on, it's called Kintsugi Bowl. Public service announcement. I used to perform for free, but now I got rates and I'm collecting fees. <laughs> I used to write for fun, but now I write for funds. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say I must have lost myself somewhere between finding my voice and wanting to feed myself. Had to bleed myself to feel like someone worthy enough to snap for or clap for. I've been adored by strangers that wear the same scars as me. Both of us smiling, but still bleeding on the inside. I've turned my insides out far too many times for free. Now you got to pay me. I'm talking cash. I don't do mic checks. I'm talking, I've turned too many mics to ash. Phoenixed my pain and eclipsed the sun with my darkness for an audience to see a silver lining in the halo. But now, I'm Master Chief. Video game reference. But now, I'm Master Chief. And this pin be my battle rifle. I'm taking shots in the dark at my destiny. Most times miss, but still give the best of me. I'll spill my guts on these stages so there's nothing left of me, but not for free. See, I'm on my Kendrick Steeds. Had to cocoon my art because they tried to pimp a butterfly, but screw waking up. Sorry, I usually curse on that part and it just messed me up. But, <laughs> but, but at performing for exposure, I say let the shutter fly. I'm tired of being the humble guy. I already tried earning my respect. Now I gotta take what's mine. Usually I let other poets get the spotlight, but now I gotta take the shine. And if you think this sounds cocky, maybe a little pretentious, you'd be very correct. This is me, affirming myself after over a decade in the game with nothing to show for it, but more of an understanding of who I am and a damaged ego. This is me, a broke but not broken poet, putting the pieces back together. I am nothing more than a black kintsugi bowl trying to stop from spilling over this poem there's nothing more than my golden cracks glimmering in the stage lights. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, yeah. And I remember feeling like that when you were here before, too. <laughs> so yeah, it's a treat, treat to have you back. Um, and now I have the utter delight um, to introduce our new St. Pete Poet Laureate. <laughs> Gloria Munoz. Um, we are so lucky to have her uh, in this community. She is a fabulous poet and um, gives so much to the arts here. And um, I am just so very happy to have passed the laurels on to you. And I know you're just going to do super cool things with it. But I have to actually read your real bio now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, Gloria is a Colombian American writer, literary translator, and an advocate for multilingual literacy and writing. Her poetry book, Danzerly, was awarded the Academy of American Poets 2019 Ambrosia Prize and the Gold Medal Florida Book Award. Woo! <laughs> Those are two really big awards. We're so proud of you for that. 
Um, other honors include a Highlights Foundation's 2022 Diverse Verse Fellowship, the Magando Workshop, Lumina's Multilingual Nonfiction Writing Award, a Las Musas Mentorship, a New York State Summer Writers Institute Fellowship, and a St. Pete Arts Alliance Muse Award, cre um, a Creative Pinellas Grant, and a University of South Florida Humanities Poetry Award. Her work has been published broadly in literary journals and, and anthologies. She's also the author of the chat book, Your Biome Has Found You. I love that title. Um, Munoz was part of the inaugural Tin House Young Authors Young Adult Workshop and recently presented her research in multilingual poetry at the Tucson um, Festival of Books. She's honored and proud to be St. Pete's Poet Laureus. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you so much, um, Helen. I think you said it was eight or nine years, which is incredible like that that this has been happening in the space for eight to nine years poetry it's awesome like we're all here for poetry so like thank you thank you really i'm gonna begin with um a light pollution it's like such a pleasure to read with you both and like hear your work and i'm gonna try to read things that are in dialogue with with what i just heard um, Light Pollution is um, a poem that was in the Flan newsletter. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's an old poem that I rewrote very recently, which I do from time to time because um, writing is a process and we're always getting hopefully better or changing or getting, I don't know, our tastes um, expand. And I do this thing where I write a poem on my birthday. Um, every birthday, like since I started like deciding that I could write poems, I was like, I'm gonna write a poem on my birthday. And this one, I think I was like 22 or 23. So like a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I'm thinking if there's anything else you need to know, I don't think so. Um, I'm gonna jump in, light pollution. Fireflies are endangered, don't know why, could be pesticides or light pollution, preventing them from finding their mates. This is what keeps me up again tonight on the eve of my birthday. The fan drags its rrr across the ceiling. Dust filters in, gilded from the streetlight. Most of our grandparents are dead or nearly there. They are quieter now and less wise or more so, but definitely full of secrets. My grandmother is mostly light as she sews in slow motion. Her right frontal lobe is a meshwork of swollen white matter. She stares at my mother before saying her name. She, like most of us, is some combination of happy and sad. There is a body resting next to me, one I love. Love the construct that drove Dante through a dark forest to reach his moon. When did I become someone's keeper? Minding, mending. We live on a nature preserve, manicured and monitored. A neon 24-hour car wash lights the living room window like the subway track we once lived next to, always daylit and humming. There are whale songs in my ears tonight. The bluish yowls resonate through my fingertips. My cell phone strobes on my nightstand. I will thank friends and family for calling in the first few hours of my new year. But right now I am occupied, counting how many whale skeletons are cradled by the ocean. And here, mapping constellations through the ceiling, 
I know there is less phantasmagoria, less starlight, but we're still flickering in the dark. Thank you. Um, so recently, like two months ago, there was an event called the Burr Gala in St. Petersburg, um, which is very cool. Uh, it's an event that celebrates diversity. Um, and it's like race without ism is their tagline. And it was such a cool night. And I was invited um, to write a poem. I was asked to write a poem for the occasion. And, you know, poets, like, we're always thinking, <laughs> it's like, it's the moon or it's death. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking, like, what can I write to unify people? I'm like, I'm going to write a poem about loss because loss unifies us all. Um, it really does. I mean, I'm, I'm, like, playing here, but I'm also, like, very serious. Like, um, Emily Dickinson said, like, a poem feels like a poem when, you know, your scalp feels like it's, like, being removed. Um, and love Emily Dickinson. But, you know, I say a poem feels like a poem to my students when it asks us, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? And that's something that I keep asking myself now as we're on this, like, downslope of this pandemic roller coaster. What are we doing? Um, we lost a lot over the past few years. Everyone did. And I don't think we've had a lot of time to just sit with that, reflect on that. It might take another decade. I don't know how long it will take. Um, maybe when writers start putting it um, in novels, I, we'll get there. Um, so this poem is about that. And there's um, a word in here. So like in Latin America, when somebody dies, um, you say present. You say their name and you say presente, presente. So you'll hear this word, presente. And when you hear that word, I just want you to hold space for someone. Um, someone you've lost, someone you miss, someone who is important to you. And if you feel motivated to get a little physical here, you can touch your heart, OK? <clears throat> presente. When the word shut down, we huddled around screens at home and wondered how. In disembodied boxes, we'd unmute and say hello, and something like solitude swallowed us. We became alive in reflections of glass screens and porcelain, and we washed and scrubbed and sanitized, sanitized. We relearned the world for each other holding on to the before and the present with every greeting and goodbye. A moment of silence for the ones we lost, say their names, sing their names, shout their names, presente. We go onward for them. We march, rise. For this is your today and your tomorrow awaits, but it won't wait too long. So vamos, ahora, there's no time to waste. Each new day starts with a heartbeat that you feel in your palm. So when you shake your neighbor's hand, you are saying hello and I love you. Because we're all here now, presente. For those who marched before us, the compression of earth under hundreds of thousands of feet, pressing, compressing for equality from 1963 to 2023, presente. Y pa'lante because this is what America looks like. And we remember this country was never ours, it's still on loan. We listen to the drums buried in the earth's core, a thousand beating hearts. Presente. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land deserves better from us. Presente. 
Palante, madres, padres, hermanas y hermanos, friends, relativity keeps us in orbit together, so you are not alone. Presente. And if you're feeling tired, we can carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you. And if you're feeling helpless, help someone. Presente. Vamos, ahora. There is no time to waste. Now, here, feel your heartbeat in your palm. And when you shake your neighbor's hand, say, Hello, and I love you, because we're all here now. Presente, presente, presente. Thank you. Um, I write across genres. It's something that I really enjoy doing. It's just, I think, I don't know, I kind of hop. Uh, between fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, and like to figure things out. Um, I'm working on a novel right now that's a uh, novel in verse. It's a YA novel in verse, and it deals with climate change and uh, loss and friendship. And it's a really wonderful like story that's just developed. Like I've been writing it for a couple of years. It's by, it's on submission right now. And um, these next two poems are from that novel in verse. I'm trying to think, OK, one thing you need to know that this character works at a charging station, like a solar panel station called Ronoko. So you'll hear that. And this is set in the near to far future. There's no date. It's supposed to feel like the uncanny valley of like what could be tomorrow, or hopefully much further down the line. <clears throat> We sell lighters shaped like alligators, manatees, and palm trees, aliens, flamingos, and merfolk. All are made of thick plastic with paint that peels after a few uses. Technically, they're refillable, but no one ever buys the cartridges. Other semi-practical disposables for sale, condoms, energy boost syringes, anti-facial recognition contacts, and the Ronoco air fresheners, ocean breeze, scented cartoon suns wearing sunglasses that smell like the blue pills I drop into the toilets on Wednesdays. Maybe the ocean smelled like fabric softener before all the oil spills and fires. Cars pull up to charge every few minutes, Flux news, as per Ronico policy, is on every screen. I've mastered the art of tuning it out. This low hum of news anchors talking over one another. And then I see the headline. Manatee removed from extinction list, now extinct. And Ofe, I don't want to cry again today when everything feels like a mediocre slide spiraling into a dark pit, but you know I'll shed so much of myself onto this counter for our favorite animal. We let the manatee, an animal with no known predator, go extinct. I reach for a manatee-shaped lighter. It flickers to life in my hand. We'll be sold out of these by the end of the week because people become nostalgic about animals as soon as they're gone. It's pathetic and pacifist. It's predatory. Thank you. And I'm going to read one more here um, from this novel, and then I'm going to wrap up with two more shorter poems. Um, so this book, I went to this really wonderful workshop um, called Y'all. It's like Y'all Fest, Y-A Fest. And it's really cool. And it was online. It was during the pandemic. And a writer 
said, when you're writing a book, they're like, put everything you love in it. Just like put everything you love in this book and it'll be the best possible thing that you can make at that time. And it was a pandemic. I had a lot of hobbies, okay? <laughs> one, one of them was roller skating very badly. Like, um, So, you know, I was like, obviously, there's going to be some roller derby in this novel. And um, we have a character here, the main character, who's nervous about trying things out that are different. And um, this poem is, you know, about that. It's her first time going to see this roller derby team that, like, her frenemy invited her to see. And she's better than this. And um, it's a villanelle uh, for those form heads out there. It's a villanelle, uh, so you'll hear a lot of repetition. Yeah. Form heads, yes. <laughs> okay. And they're called the Teenage Skirt Bags. That's the name of the team, OK? <laughs> all right, that's it. That's all you need to know. If you hate it, leave. But what if you love it? Punk music blares as skaters glide and roar. It's magic here, or it might be the punk and day glow. I'm unsure, entering the rink. I hold my breath. Punk music blares as skaters glide and roar across the surface of a neon planet. I'm unsure. Entering the rink, I hold my breath. I belong on the sidelines with the skirt bag fans. Across the surface of a neon planet, I skid, I buckle, I brace myself for impact. I belong on the sidelines with the skirt bag fans. The teenage skirt bags crash, slam, spin, dash. I skid, I buckle, I brace myself for impact. Mom says that there are places in the world that feel sacred. The teenage skirt bags crash, slam, spin, dash. Janine skates over, takes off her helmet, and shouts. Mom says that there are places in the world that feel sacred. It's magic here. Or it might be the punk and day glow. Janine skates over, takes off her helmet, and shouts, If you hate it, leave. But what if you love it? Thank you. Um, and I'm going to end with uh, two poems here. Florida, man. I like, there are poems that I like want to shelve and not like read anymore, but this shit keeps happening. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, what is going on? Um, so I'm going to read two that are um, socially poems that I wrote during, you know, a couple years ago. It's all like deja vu. Uh, like, I don't know, a handful, seven, six years ago, when uh, we were hearing a lot of the same rhetoric that we're hearing now. Um, yeah, and here we are. <clears throat> the bear. The six-year-old tells me about the drill at school. How the carpet imprint, imprinted bumps in palms and knees and made them itchy. How it smelled like pee and cereal under the desk. How she started to sing but was quietly, quickly silenced by, no, there's no singing when the bear comes. If would have been a better word choice. The bear has teeth and claws. The bear is out for dinner. If the bear comes. Many of these children have never seen a bear. But they know they could meet one at any minute. And they know to become quieter, smaller. <clears throat> yeah, I will say like I'm teaching right now and I have students who have lost, like, I'm always like, don't talk about this glory because I start like just crying, but who have lost 
family and friends to like siblings and friends to school shootings. Um, and it is that is a reality that they're growing up with. It's really it's we need some changes. Um, and this last poem is um, called The Romantics. I'm going to end on a, a poem that brings me a lot of joy to read. And it's one that was written in response to um, name calling to people being called bad hombres and to um, gay voices being suppressed and to um, there being a lot of sort of anti-immigration speak, anti-immigrant speak. Um, the Romantics. We are high and eating everything. A Costco bag of Chex Mix, a jar of olives. There's a mouthful of foil between us in bed from mouthfuls of kisses. We three, asleep on our trash, brimming like subway rats after a baseball game. We are high and eating the tangerine, tangerine sunrise, consuming our paranoid shoulders as we bury each other again, 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 again in the sand. We are high and eating amp feedback, sweat, the band's emo harmonies, nicotine sticks to our hairs, the syrupy bass pours through us. We're a uniform stack of buttermilk pancakes. We are high and eating our fingernails in front of our parents at mass, school plays, holidays, and graduations. They were all born in other countries. We're supposed to be better than this. We sneak into the kitchen window. We prop open with a silent sponge. Each silver soap bubble hushes. See, 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 as we slide over the sink and into a slumbering house. We are high and eating milk duds at another midnight screening of The Matrix. Neo is dope, but idiotic. <laughs> we bend like three melting spoons around each other, pretend we are dreaming. We are high and eating everything with our legs hanging off the jetty. Bioluminescence climbs our calves and smoke inhales us. A glow, a glow. We're into the romantics and decide we won't make it past 25. We promise to marry each other if we're too afraid of everyone else. Our heads rest on the dock. Night blooms over us. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for that great, for that great reading. Um, and so fun to hear you read from your new book. Thank you. So, yeah. You said that's in the submission stage now? Mm -hmm. Yes. This yeah. is wood, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that's great. Well, so this is the time when we segue into our Q&A. Um, and so we take questions from you guys, from the audience, and I can also prompt them along as we go. Yes, Keith, please. Thank you. And I'd like to know, uh, Gloria mentioned uh, Emily Dickinson. Is there a quote in history that inspired your identity as a show? Hmm. Um, great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, um, I've never really thought about that. Poets that I love are like D.A. Powell, Mary Ruth Lee. Um, I don't really know about that, to be honest. I, I was trying to think of who I read when I was younger. <laughs> I read a lot of the Bible. And the Bible <laughs> oh, has wow. a lot of poems in there. Sure, so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I also really quick want to say, like, if you've ever thought about dating a poet, I mean, after Curtis is yeah. like, love poems. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of breakup poems out there. Too. <laughs> Just date a poet. Uh, <laughs> so that, I, yeah, that's my my answer. Thank you for that question. I'm gonna. <laughs> How about the the rest of you? Do, do um, poets that you? There's a poem called Count on It by a poet named Miles Hodges that was really impactful for me. It was actually the inspiration behind the tattoo that I referenced in my poem. Oh, really? Um, and it kind of helped me view life in a different way, in a mm -hmm. different and, I think, healthy way. When did you come across it? Do you remember about how old when, you were? Were you young? Uh, well, you're still I was, young. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I would say, I think I was probably around like nineteen or so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, good. Yeah. Gloria, anybody you want to um, mention? I'm trying to think of like early books. Like I read Carl Sagan, like um, Contact, mm -hmm. when I was like too young to know what was happening. <laughs> um, but it really stuck with me. And then I like kept like I read it with my dad, and then I read it again with my dad because I was like, I'm gonna figure this out mm -hmm. to get to the bottom of it. I was like ten or eleven. So that book, for some reason, is just like one I think mm -hmm. about all the time, and yeah. um, and I loved uh, Isabella Allende like anything. Mm, yeah, that mm -hmm. I yeah. Heard yeah. Growing up, yeah, yeah so Every now and then, I'm asked um, by typically a, young, a younger poet will ask me, "Well, do you think to be a poet, I need to read a lot of, of poetry?" Which is kind of an interesting question, um, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and ideally, read widely. You know, um, even even now when I sit down to to write a poem, I'm often making myself uh, read poems that are completely different from what I typically like to even write. It just sort of pushes me beyond um, what I want to do. So, I think that's that's a really great thing to, for all of us to do as poets is just read a broad um, spectrum. Averse. Okay, other questions? Yes, right here. Uh, do you recall how early that language uh, came alive for you? That you really understood this was something to be part of your life? All of you. Yeah. I started, uh, I, I started doing poetry um, in high school, and so my freshman year of high school, we, uh, I, w I went to Blake, which is a magnet school, mm, and I was a creative school. writing major. And mm. we do a fresh, they do a freshman reading um, for freshmen. And we got to organize our own reading. And that was the first time I had uh, performed a poem from memory in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time I felt like I truly, truly made my parents like really proud of me. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, ever since then, I knew it was like, okay, this is something I'm going to keep doing because I like that feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Um, my family, when I was uh, really young, had a lot of parties, like a lot of big, really big parties. And the kids, like, it wasn't like now, like I have like an extreme like bedtime routine for my toddler. But back then it was like, you fall asleep on the coats or fall asleep wherever. <laughs> That's and, true. Um, like, past, like, it was always, like, past midnight where um, I was, like, I'm staying up. I'm doing this. And um, adults, like, family members would stand up and, like, start, like, telling jokes, like, really often, like, wildly inappropriate, like, jokes. But they would, like, start telling jokes, like, these long, like, epic jokes um, or, like, start um, reciting poetry. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes, like they would do, like a chain, like a poem, like a cadena, like it's like, mm -hmm. like you start, like a mad lib kind of thing. You start it, you pick it up, you pick it up, mm -hmm. and I think like that just was exciting to me, like yeah. to see people like who I knew like stand up and like declare, so, like declare in Spanish, like when you say like you're gonna read a poem or say a poem, it's like called like declaring it. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I think mm -hmm. that kind of opened my eyes to like, yeah. oh, I want to read like of people I want to write things and share them with people um, I'm an introvert but with poetry I feel like excited like I'm like we're in a vortex together and we're doing this <laughs> <laughs> yeah I have two
two moments that stick out to me. So I read a poem for my grandmother, and she's the person that taught me how to read. So when mm -hmm. I was really young, she would read to me every night and punish me by not reading to me. And I didn't mm. realize that was, like, you know, wild and, like, you know, people hated to read. So <laughs> I come from, like, a long line of Southern storytellers. So writing and, you know, telling a story has all been very important to us. And then I think, too, for me, the, I understand the power of words as a protective thing for me because I grew up a Southern Baptist. When I said I read the Bible a lot, I literally have read the Bible a lot, you know. <laughs> Um, and I went to a school where you get kicked out for being gay, right? So I would be picked on a lot for my voice. I, you know, have a more effeminate voice or whatever. So I had this weird thing where if words could hurt me, then I needed to know as many words as possible. Mm. So then I could use that as protection. So mm. I was like reading William Faulkner when I was like in fifth grade, mm. understanding none of William Faulkner. <laughs> I, I used to teach Ole Miss, so if anybody's watching, love William Faulkner, uh, <laughs> but I still don't get, I still can't read William Faulkner, but so um, in a really real way, like words have protected me for my whole life, basically, so. Mm. Mm. I love that, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, yes, back there, Roy. Barbara Walters, years ago, interviewed a famous American songwriter, his name is Sammy Kahn. Yeah, so with me, uh, it's something that I've started doing fairly recently, um, within the last couple of years or so. Um, I find it really fun um, and challenging, uh, especially because most people reach out very late. <laughs> and so you have to come up with something, especially like a commissioned poem. Um, but I look at it as almost kind of like form poetry, where you're given the, these topics and there's it's for a certain event and it's like okay now I have to like fit my art into these you know these uh, boxes basically um, and when I have done it it's been pretty successful so I think that adds to the fun of it it's like okay I can pull it off um, but yeah for me uh, it's just a balance of like trying to fit me into what they want um, and I think it's a fun process. Uh, and again, still challenging. And, uh, but I'm, I'm someone who like uh, works well under pressure. A lot, a lot of times I need that pressure to really get off my butt and do something. Um, so it's like, it's kind of like perfect for me. Yeah, I feel similarly. Like it's always a challenge. People do ask really late sometimes. <laughs> um, it, you know, to get it not to feel like homework, right? I think of like that like form and function and experimentation. Um, Cause it can be hard if somebody's like write a poem that fits, has these topics for this audience. And you're like, ooh, like now I'm thinking of that audience, like I'm thinking of all these things. Um, so I have to just find a way in. Like it means finding a way to make it something that I feel like I connect with. Um, thematically or personally. And I think, I love that you brought up Barbara Walters because my grandmother and I took, going to talk about her some more. We would play Barbara Walters at the dining room table, like 20 questions. <laughs> so I like, yeah, you know, as a kid, Barbara Walters is so glamorous. Um, I also was like, a, I've been a journalist, so I'm working on deadline, working on the story. But for example, like um, when I, people ask me to write stuff like for their books or whatever, but. For example, for this event, I really knew that I, I wrote a poem for it because I really I wanted to have that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think like what Curtis is saying is figuring out what how I want to use my voice in there and then fitting it into the framework. But I have like, listen, I'm up for commissions. If anybody's asking, <laughs> <laughs> to 
because I have all of these ideas. So it's nice to be like, oh, you have to do this in this moment. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take this idea with this one and make it fit this mm-hmm. like situation. Yeah, yeah, good, good answer. Um, I would just add to that that um, well, two things. First, it's um, it's humbling in a way, you know, if someone reaches out and wants you to to write a poem for them or a, for a particular occasion. Um, and I was asked to write a short poem for the base of the 9-11 monument, which is over in Wada. Um, and the wonderful visual artist, Mark Ayling, did a huge sculpture um, and invited me to be part of that, which was very kind of him. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. It took me forever. And I went through so many drafts. And, and also, you know, um, they wanted it to be a poem, not about what happened with 9-11, but rather to be about the resiliency of the human spirit coming together after that. Um, and so I understood that and I wanted I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it well, but it was hard because it was also at a time when politically we were all very divided, you know? And it was important to me to write something that I thought was true. Um, so anyway, it was, a, it, was, uh, it was a big challenge to do that. And also then to know it was gonna be in stone was kind of terrifying. <laughs> um, but occasion poems are, um, they, they can be tough. They can be tricky because you never want to sound didactic. You know, as soon as you sound like you're preaching, you, you lose your audience, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I hope some of you were able to hear Gloria's amazing um, Somo St. Pete poem. Um, if, you, if you didn't hear it at the State of the, state of the um, City, you need to, to find that online and, and hear that, that poem. You just did a fabulous job with that. So other questions? Yes, back here. Good question. You want to start, Tyler? Sure. So, for so I teach first year writing, and I'm I teach creative writing. LG, I'm teaching a currently an LGBTQ course uh, on creative writing, and we're talking about poetry too. Um, I want to say two things about that. So I didn't identify as a poet until much, even though I was writing poems until much later because I was a prose writer, and until I had to take a workshop in my MFA program, and. Um, so I think it's hard to identify that. And now that's why, like, in my poems, I'm like, no, I'm a poet. You know, that's, like, <laughs> intentional, right? So I think even saying that is difficult. But then there's this book called Madness, Rack, and Honey by Mary Ruthley. Mm, and she, book. like, my interpretation of it is she says the moon is our first poem. And so after <laughs> I read that, I'm like, if the moon is our first poem, then, like, I can write a poem, you know? Um, <laughs> So I think for me, like if we're talking about grading, I, where I'm at now, it's like, what do you want to accomplish with this poem? Like, what do you want out of this? So I can like judge my feedback based on that. But I'm also a formalist poet, like I love form. So if you wanna write a villanelle, I can help you do that. Um, Cause I think there's something nice about the constraints of forms. And I think that they can be sexy as well. Um, but I don't know, I'm just like, if that, what do you want to accomplish and how can I help you accomplish that? And I also think just one thing too, there's, I have like a, a background in composition and rhetoric and there's a really big push about like anti-racist grading practices. So, you know, thinking about like what models work for different kinds of writers and literacy experiences, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. I think that grading is, is wild and it's not something that I love, but like, you know, so, so not crushing the spirit, but still helping people get to where they want to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'll just recommend a book um, that you might be interested in, Felicia Rose Chavez's um, The Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, um, because it talks about like decentering the power dynamic of the writing workshop and giving more ownership to the writer um, and like the amount of subjectivity that there is in workshopping poems. Um, it's really wonderful. Uh, I use it with my students and they seem to really like respond to that. Like if if they're 
teaching us about their poem, like they're gonna catch things on their own. Like honestly, like they, they're doing the work and they're they're into it, like which is great. Most of my experience with teaching is through a poetry workshop. So I don't have like a grading, you know, poems experience, but uh, I mostly work with like high school aged uh, students and, you know, high schoolers have a lot going on. Um, <laughs> so like the poetry is mainly like, the, for me, I focus mainly on like helping them identify like their most authentic self is like what I try to tell them is like, poetry, like especially with spoken word poetry, a lot of people think that uh, you're supposed to be putting on a performance, whereas uh, the most best, the best performances are the ones where you're just being genuine and authentic, and the audience can pick up when someone's being genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what I try to teach them is just, you know, stop trying to read the poem uh, tr or put on a performance, just like talk to me like you're like you're talking to one of your friends, mm -hmm. basically and helping them like try to find their, their voice because that's what was most impactful for me when I was a youth doing poetry. Mm, that's good. Just two things I want to add real quickly to that question, and it's a good question. Um, grading, creative writing is so hard. You know, you, you hate to do it at all because the last thing you ever want to do is, is um, make somebody, you know, not feel good about what they're doing and, and then turn away from from their work. But what is really important to me is um, that the student cares about craft and believes in the importance of revision, you know, sees themselves as capable of, um, you know, playing around with it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of joy to be found in that, you know, and I'm a big believer in that. So when teaching can incorporate the revision process, when you can, you know, have your grading be based on how, how hard you see the work on the page, you know, moving stuff around, cutting things, being willing to put things together and take them apart. Um, but really, the, the person who ought to be ask, a, answering this question is Peter Mikey, because he was the best teacher ever. <laughs> he was really great. And, um, um, and he wrote a wonderful book called The Shape of Poetry, that if you guys have not seen that book, you might check it out. So I think we probably have time for just one more question from you guys. Anybody? If not, then I'm going to ask one real quick. Um, because we've talked a little bit about form. Um, and I love what you said, Tyler. You're absolutely right. I love form, too. And what I love about it is the compression. Um, and often with form, if, it's, if you're dealing with a subject matter of grief, being able to pour yourself into that tight vessel can really um, help your writing a lot. But can you talk a little bit about, about form? Form is everything. I mean, even free verse poetry, of course, is... Um, as it's, it, that doesn't mean there's no form. It means that the form takes off from where, what the poem wants to be. Anybody want to talk a little bit about form and your thoughts and when you use it, how you decide whether or not to go with a traditional form versus a nonce form? Any, any thoughts? I love sonnets. I think they're like the sexiest form. <laughs> Perfect like, for like, Valentine's Day. Yeah, they are. They're, I mean, right? But I don't know. There's like They're really nice because there's 14 lines, which I think is substantial. You can also play around with rhyme. I love rhyming because, you know, it's like my grandma, here we go again. Like, if it doesn't rhyme, it's not a poem, right? But like, I reject that. But now I like to play with rhyme in an unexpected way because mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's fun, especially right. if you're rhyming like naughty words or whatever, you know? Um, <laughs> it's just fun. Um, so I really like that because it gives you something to work with. Like, right. you're talking like, Roy asked about, you know, when you get this call, but you know, a lot of, you don't get the call a lot, like in terms of like your writing practice is mm -hmm. your practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The desk does not call you. I mean, mm -hmm. the muse does not call me enough, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think a form is a really good place to start because yeah. you know like when you can just do it, That's you right. know, and like work towards that. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I use form a lot to kind of tinker, like I'll, I revise in form a lot. Mm -hmm. And even if I put something, like, I'll, like, be, like, I'm going to force this to be a hustle or, like, a whatever, a sonnet. I love the crown of sonnets. Mm -hmm. And, like, sometimes mm -hmm. I want to torture myself and do the upright thought. Um, and then I'll take it out of it. Yeah. Like, take it apart from there. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like the car wash, you know, like the, like, really wonderful car wash you can sit, <laughs> sit through. That's a great it's simile. Like you're going through in form, and then you're figuring out the poem. Like I love form, like as a final piece, also like, but that's usually very intentional. And I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about the quality of the form and why it fits the poem and the topic and right. all of that. 
Um, but a lot of times it feels like I'm going to put it in a different outfit and see mm-hmm. if this poem is making any sense. Right. Or yeah. not. Good. 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 Um, for me, I'm not going to lie and like pretend like I write poems all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is, like I was speaking to or, towards earlier, uh, for me, I do think it is a very great tool um, mm-hmm. to hone your writing in. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of form poetry, like, in high school, I think that yeah, might be why I don't do it so much now because I got a little scarred. But um, <laughs> but but uh, I do think that it heavily, heavily, heavily influenced my writing still to this day. Um, I think especially like writing an iambic pentameter and everything mm-hmm. like that. Like my my uh, writing uh, grew its own natural like cadence mm-hmm. um, and flow, and it, it, with my rhyming as well, it helped me. Mm-hmm figure out different ways to I love rhyming as well but I love to I love to do it in a way where it's like it's not Mm. super noticeable and that's what you have to do in in form poetry Mm -hmm. or at least that's what my preference is to not make the rhyming super noticeable but it's still there Mm -hmm. um and I like to do that in my writing still today so I think it informed like the type of poet that I am Mm -hmm. um and I still do mess around with them um and because it is like I said a a great tool uh to like sharpen my pen Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly, and, and what you're talking about, off rhyme and slant rhyme, um, and other uses um, of music, right? Mm-hmm. So alliteration, assonance, all those things that come into play that, that create the sound work for the poem, yeah. And sonnets are having a big moment because yeah. of Diane Seuss, yeah. right? She's a poet some of you all probably have heard of. She won the Pulitzer Prize for her book um, called Frank. It's a whole, the whole book is sonnets. So um, check that out if you, if you haven't seen that. Um, Yeah, well, I'm sorry that we don't have more time, but um, thank you all again for coming to the Dolly Poetry Series. And thank you, Tyler, Gloria, and Curtis for being here. Um, Please go buy some books, and you guys go sign some books, if you will. So, my gosh, yes.